All right, perfect. All right, so um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, really excited to get a chance to uh, talk about my research with all of you. And I think we'll have some interesting discussions. We've had some great questions come in on the Murrow board. I made a note of all those. Um, uh, I, I think uh, those will make for some great discussions. And as Wendy said, if you have more questions, just feel free to put them on the, the board or in the chat. Um, I'd like to get started um, with talking about how I got into haptics because that's often um, the, the first question I get. Actually, the first question I usually uh, get is, what is haptics? When I go to conferences, not really so much anymore with um, HCI conferences, um, but uh, I, I still get that question. So I know um, a lot of us on, on uh, uh, in today's meeting is familiar, you know, we're familiar with haptics, but for those who are not, I like to think of haptics. I, I like to define haptics as the science and, and engineering of touch and technology. So it's kind of that confluence of uh, touch and haptic per perception uh, combined with technology. So the, the word haptics um, comes from the Greek word haptikos, uh, meaning of or relating to the sense of touch. And so those of us who work in the field of haptics, we are studying touch from every perspective. So uh, in a given day, I may be looking uh, into the literature um, uh, uh, in uh, neuroscience related to touch or psychology or physiology or psychophysics, but we're also building technologies and, and running experimental studies. So it's, it's a very uh, interdisciplinary field, a very exciting area to work in. Um, as I said, the other question I get is, how did I get started in Haptic? So the, the project I have here on the screen, this was the very first project I worked on as an undergraduate student. And we were building, um, we were given the task of building a surgical simulator um, for some surgeons at a local hospital. And they weren't happy with the way that, um, uh, lapar laparoscopy was done, the laparoscopic uh, 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 surgical technique, how the training was done for that. It was a very slow and tedious process. They do this ring placement task where they use these tools and they have to place rings on, on, on pegs. And they asked, could we make this virtual and um, kind of hone these fine motor skills in, in that way? So I don't know if you guys will be able to see the, the videos playing now, but this was a, a virtual um, ring placement task we built using a phantom haptic joystick. And we set this up in the, um, in the, in the hospital where residents could use it to train. And um, we did a whole bunch of studies and the project ended up you know, lasting for a, a few years. And it was a great collaborative project. And it, what motivated me to intern to grad school. Um, and so this lapar laparoscopic surgery, you know, you're using these fine tools, you're making small incisions in the abdomen so you can get in, do the work, then get out. Um, and so they, they do these simple tasks with these tools, like placing rings on pegs to hone those fine motor skills. So this was a pretty successful project. It piqued my interest in haptics because um, we were using haptic feedback to um, make it feel like you were actually placing rings on pegs like you normally would with their physical prototype. Um, so I had to understand the sense of touch, how it worked, how to work with a haptic device, and also had some great interactions with some of the surgeons. And so went to grad school. And um, after that, I uh, during grad school, you know, I had to figure out what I was going to work on, and I became very interested in uh, understanding how we process information. And I was very intrigued by sensory overload. Um, if we look, look at the interfaces we interact with on a daily basis, they're usually audio and visual. Um, and, you know, I have some um, uh, example scenarios on the screen here. So the, the you know, the pilot cockpit and um, 
uh, various other interfaces that uh, we're familiar with that do have opportunities for, for sensory, sensory overload. So I began thinking, wow, what if we could offload uh, some of this information to the sense of touch? And I started looking around at, you know, all the devices that engage our sense of touch, either as a receptive channel or an input device. And there's a lot of examples out there, but it was quite surprising to see that our sense of, sense of touch is largely underutilized and still underutilized today by technology. And this is particularly impressive given that our skin is, uh, it's really our largest sensory organ. It's also our oldest, it's the first to develop. And as a receptive surface, it is quite impressive um, in terms of its spatial and temporal acuity. And also it's multimodal. So we can sense and perceive vibrations, um, a wide range of pressure, uh, temperature, pain, uh, and, and so on. So the question is why, why don't devices utilize the sense of touch uh, uh, more? Um, and if we were to uh, use our skin as a communication channel, um, how could we achieve rich communication um, and build sort of haptic languages that, that are intuitive? And so that was um, the topic of my uh, dissertation work, um, very much on the, the theoretical side. Um, along the way, I became very interested in working with individuals with disabilities. I started out working with people who are blind, and part of that came about through a focus group. And we did a focus group with individuals who are blind. We did not lead with technology. We went in and we asked, what are the biggest challenges you're facing? And here are some quotes uh, from that focus group. Someone said, you know, I'd like to walk into a library, pick up any book and read it. This was before um, uh, all the, the devices that are available now that have solved this problem. Um, so this, you know, these quotes are coming from a, um, a focus group. We did probably, uh, this was probably back around, um, I wanna say like 2000, 2001. Um, so this was, this was a while back. Um, another quote was, I would like to take notes as well as any other students in my classes. I'd like feedback on my personal mannerisms and the facial expressions and other cues from my partner. And, and that actually that quote is the one that um, uh, I based a lot of the work that I'm going to talk to you today about. Uh, that's what I based it on that. Um, because uh, I, I thought that was really interesting. I never really thought about how social interactions could be inaccessible to someone. Um, so I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then that last quote, don't obstruct my hearing, um, that for me really resonated because um, that was uh, sort of a, um, uh, uh, you know, red flag, hey, uh, let's use another means of communication. Why does every have to, everything have to be through audio? Um, and so I thought, well, I'm interested in haptics, um, and this is an interesting problem area to look at. Uh, what kind of innovations can we do in this area and bring about? So I started um, looking into social interactions uh, because at the time, you know, uh, I didn't really know uh, much about them other than that we're engaged with in them every day and it seems pretty straightforward but once you start to kind of break down what a social interaction is uh, then the complexity comes about so um, they're composed of both verbal cues of course so you know speech but then the majority of a social interaction is nonverbal. so we make facial expressions um, we use gestures like I'm doing right now, uh, we use eye, eye gaze. So if it's in a group, we look at different people, especially if we wanna ask a question to someone, we'll look at that person. Um, but even in a one-on-one, -on -one, 
um, we use eye gaze in different ways. So if we're trying to think of an answer, you know, we may look up and you know, ponder and then reply. So, uh, or to get someone's attention, uh, if there's an object of interest in the environment, we use eye, eye gaze to direct attention and we may point. Um, the physical appearance of what we're wearing, um, that also contributes to that social interaction. Um, so proximix is the study of interpersonal distance, how far we're standing away from someone, um, and then personal mannerisms. So as you can see, there's a lot in terms of the, the nonverbal cues that can be communicated. And in general, very general, they tend to make up about 65% of that information exchange. Now, some of the nonverbal cues may not be useful to the, uh, the information being exchanged itself, but a lot is, I think, uh, generally. So out of all, these nonverbal cues, um, I actually started with uh, Proximix, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, but I think what interested me the most out of these um, was facial expressions, given its complexity. And so, of course, I'll spend the majority of, of today's talk um, talking about my work in that space. Uh, to start, we wanted to um, engage this population further um, with a survey. Uh, so we uh, did a survey um, where we recruited 27 participants. Uh, we had 16 blind, nine low vision. And then we also had uh, two specialists who work in the area who were cited. And we did a survey on social needs to kind of get a sense of what were the most important uh, social needs we could address. And, you know, top two, feedback on personal mannerisms, and second one, understanding facial expressions, uh, were ranked the highest. Um, the feedback on personal mannerisms is an interesting one, and we did some work in that space as well. So typically, you know, sighted people, if we're interacting with someone and, you know, they have a uh, a weird personal mannerism, we may give them feedback, right? So you have that social feedback loop. And for those who are blind, they often miss out on that. And so um, people who are blind may have different mannerisms. One common one is body rocking. So they'll rock. Um, and if you don't have that social feedback um, uh, early on, you know, that, that habit may progress. And so we actually heard from a lot of people who are blind who are like, hey, I, I want feedback on my mannerisms. And so we built a very simple system using an accelerometer. And um, we uh, trained a machine learning model to recognize when someone was rocking um, and uh, provided um, vibrotactile feedback as an alert. Um, so that was a, just a very simple project we did. Um, but most of our focus went on that second uh, social need, uh, understanding facial expressions. And I should mention that a big motivator of this um, was a conversation I had um, with um, an individual. Uh, she was born blind. And uh, she told me that social interactions are a challenge, a big challenge for her, not with family and loved ones. You know, she said, when I'm in the comfort of my own home interacting with my loved ones, it's no, it's no problem. But when I'm at work in a group meeting where, um, you know, social cues are so important, communication is so critical, then I need assistive technology. And she gave me a lot of examples where someone would ask a question, and if they don't put a name at the end of the question, then she couldn't tell who the question is directed to. Um, or situations where she would be passing someone in the hallway and wonder, well, uh, who was that? Was that a coworker and they were just keeping quiet? And so that really, um, that was inspiring uh, to me in the sense that I, I really wanted to try to address this problem. 
And so we put together a proposal to the National Science Foundation and it was awarded uh, for half a million to build assistive, social, situational awareness aids for individuals with disabilities. And we wanted to look at a number of things. We wanted to um, focus on the machine learning and computer vision side, but equally on the interaction side and delivery mechanisms. So part of it was developing new algorithms for uh, face and person detection, head pose estimation, facial expression recognition, and so on. And we did do a lot of, a lot of work in that space, but equally uh, on the interaction side as well. So understanding if we can extract this information, what's the best way to communicate it? And based on our findings as part of focus groups and interviews and surveys, individuals who are blind repeatedly told us, don't obstruct our hearing. Some information's fine, but I don't want my hearing obstructed, especially if I'm out in public trying to cross a street or you know, doing something else that where my, um, my hearing is critical. And the quote that really stood out for me, someone told me, if you obstruct my hearing, it's like blindfolding someone who is sighted. And so from that point on, um, my goal was to explore as much as possible what we could communicate through the sense of touch. And I like to think of these technologies as sensory substitution devices because you are taking uh, information that's largely perceived visually like facial expressions and communicating it uh, to the sense of touch, to a different modality. So as I mentioned, we started with Proximix. So how far is someone away from you is basically, um, basically what it is. So two things, right? The direction, what angle is someone at relative to you and the distance. So this seems like a social cue that um, may be trivial or not need it, but it turns out that it's so important for individuals who are blind, especially in group situations. So some, um, some stories I, I was told, someone who is blind, a fellow researcher told me he was at a conference one time and was talking with another attendee and I guess the attendee didn't like what he was saying so they just walked away and here he is just talking to you know thin air and he said if I just had something that could tell me where someone was standing relative to me and their distance and then I had another story where someone said um, you know if I'm talking with someone and it doesn't matter one or one or uh, you know, one on one or a group scenario, unless you're sitting at a table, if everyone's standing up, people do move around, people do shift. And she was explaining to me that it's so important. She wanted to make and maintain eye contact with people, but it was near impossible to do in such situations. So to solve this problem, um, our first prototype is shown on the screen here. Simple vibrotactile belt using pancake motors. Um, these are ERM motors with, which basically have an off-center mass. Um, and you know, when you turn them on, apply a voltage, it mass just spins around and, and they vibrate. Um, and uh, for these simple motors, uh, intensity uh, and frequency are coupled. You cannot control them independently, but for us, uh, that was fine because we just wanted a simple kind of on and off um, uh, interaction. Um, we have uh, seven motors around the waist and uh, to start um, we uh, looked into the existing work on, on psychophysics and I'll talk about that in the next slide um, but seven motors and they kind of um, co uh, correspond to uh, where someone is at in your visual field. So if you look on the left there, we can divide it up into different regions, one through seven. So if someone's on, you know, standing on my left side, you feel a vibration on your left side. On right side, you feel it um, on your uh, on seven. And then if someone's approximately in the middle, 
could be you know motor four or five that goes off and it depends on where that their faces detect it in the center of that face image um, and uh, we tried the center we also tried the corner we have the corner being used in in the photo um, as long as it's approximate it it uh, it works um, and of course you need a camera and so we used um, a pair of sunglasses with a, a discreetly embedded video camera and our first pilot test with this device uh, with individuals who are blind uh, we actually had one person tell us um, it's like an instant reflex their exact words an instant reflex no training no nothing they knew exactly what was happening and they could shift their their head uh, to make eye contact with who they wanted to and that was you know very simple just one or two we eventually uh, bumped it up to about three people that the user could interact with and make eye contact with all of them um, beyond that though once you get to about you know four or more it's just, just overwhelming because all you feel are these vibrations around your waist and you, you really i mean at that point um, you, you can't make much sense of it uh, but it works for a small number at least uh, the basis for design, again, we looked in into the psychophysical research. Um, Chalawake's done a lot of work on uh, vibrotactile local localization around the waist. Um, and uh, we um, followed this work uh, in terms of how to space out these motors so that people could localize the vibrations. Because ultimately, if you can't localize these, you can't recognize where you know the exact site, um, then it's going to be you know challenging to figure out what's happening. So we wanted to to leverage this this research work, and then um, same with the you know um, Van Erp's work in vibrotactile spatial acuity uh, around the waist, um, and then also looking at the work on you know, burst duration and, and the separation uh, of, of these vibrations. More important for rhythm, um, which I'll talk about next. So that's direction, but how do you communicate distance? Um, we used, uh, we explored everything from duration to basic rhythms to the analogy of a heartbeat um, to look at how we could communicate whether someone was standing in your intimate space, your personal space, social space, or public space. And the reason we went with this, um, these groups, which is um, uh, uh, sort of the breakdown for American culture, um, is we had a lot of people tell us, I'd like to initiate an interaction. I want to know when someone's approaching me, so I can reach out my hand and, and shake their hand. Um, and so we had that in mind when we were doing this and we had a lot of success with the, the heartbeat rhythm. Um, a lot of people said that it was very intuitive. Um, so training time could be minimized. Uh, of course, uh, with Weber's law, you can, you can run into some challenges and that's what we encountered if we were just using lower order dimensions like duration. So, you know, of course, the longer the duration, the more separated those stimulus patterns need to be so people can recognize them. Because um, this is all based on um, uh, absolute uh, recognition. Um, if we do something that's relative, then you can leverage that. But um, we wanted something where people could recognize these individually. So uh, the heartbeat rhythms worked uh, uh, better uh, for this situation. Uh, that first belt you saw, very simple. Uh, the motors could not be moved around. It was Velcro uh, wired to a, a computer over parallel port. Uh, so our second design, we created a haptic belt that was wireless. You could add remove motors. You could move them around on the belt, buckle, system so one size fits all and we improved a lot of things related to performance and you know focused on usability and and, and uh, those aspects 
Okay, so now I want to spend the majority uh, of the rem you know remainder of the talk on uh, emotions and facial expressions. So after we were done looking at Proximix, um, I devoted a, a lot of time um, uh, to facial expressions and emotions. And uh, by now, uh, looking at the date for this first publication, it's, it's amazing how time flies. So I guess as of now, I have been working on this problem for over, uh, over a decade now. Um, so this was our first stab at the problem. Um, we started out asking, could someone uh, perceive an emotion uh, just by having access to a sort of emoticon representation? Okay, so if someone is smiling, can an algorithm classify that as happy and then convey sort of a smiley face to the back of the hand? So these are drawn, these are spatiotemporal patterns. At this point, we're not leveraging any perceptual illusions like, you know, saltation, the cutaneous rabbit, nothing like that. It was just very simple. Uh, in this case, A, F, G, very, just very, a very simple spatiotemporal pattern. If someone is frowning, draw a um, frown on the back of the hand. If someone is surprised, draw a circle. So it's all based on mouth shape, neutral, straight across. Uh, and again, we're using very simple pancake motors, designs very simple, you know, just a proof of concept to try this out. For more, um, you know, lack of a better word, complex um, expressions or emotions like angry or fear or disgust, um, we had to get a little bit more creative in, in how we designed uh, some of the patterns. Um, and what we went with it, uh, is shown on the left there. Um, these patterns are a result of extensive pilot testing with individuals who are blind. So we didn't just, um, you know, kind of come up with these and say, hey, this is what we're using. We did do extensive pilot testing. And overall, uh, the results were quite impressive. I have the recognition accuracies on the right there. So you see for each pattern, it was above 80% uh, uh, for, for, um, for each one. Um, a few uh, reached uh, over 90%. And then actually for that second group, average accuracy was 93%. I split those up into group one and group two because I thought group two, these were going to be, you know, uh, less intuitive compared to the simple emoticons. Let's see. Um, the main takeaways from this early pilot test are as follows. Um, some of the feedback we received uh, was, wow, I can understand uh, someone's facial expression for the first time. For the first time, I actually know the emotion uh, or the facial expression um, being expressed. And so for some, uh, some participants, that was quite an incredible experience. Um, you know, we, we had uh, one individual who was born blind and for her to say, this is the first time I'm experiencing this, it was a pretty incredible moment. Um, we also had a lot of people say that, you know, this is incredible, but now that I have a, a, a sense of what's possible, uh, I want more, okay? I want greater access. I wanna know all the subtleties. In fact, my, my favorite quote of everything, someone asked, could you build a device that would allow me to fill someone's detailed expressions without literally filling their face. Um, and so that kind of took us in an exciting direction, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, and then the last quote that I took away from there was the pattern for fear made me fearful. It actually made someone experience fear. Uh, and that was an interesting um, anomaly and something I wanted to revisit and I'll also talk about my work, my work on uh, in the space of affect where we where we explored that. So 
Next step, we built this haptic face display. So it's a vibro tactile, two-dimensional two vibro tactile array. Uh, and we have, it's a six by eight array of pancake motors. Um, and uh, just embedded on a, a basic ergonomic office chair. And uh, just simple video technology, a webcam that could be mounted, mounted on a tabletop to face your interaction partner. We also identified that there's different levels of mediation, so different levels of abstraction. You could have a literal mapping where you basically track the features of a face and display those directly. You could have a more symbolic mapping, like, okay, they're happy, sad, surprised, like you saw with the, the first prototype. Or you could have sort of a middle ground. And ultimately, the bulk of this work um, we decided to go the middle ground uh, and specifically focus on facial action units. I'll talk about those in just a moment because we want it to, um, we didn't want the computer to solve the problem completely. Uh, you know, as someone happy, sad, surprised, we want it to leave that up to the user. So we wanted the user to have access to information where they could understand the subtleties of the expression and uh, make their own conclusions about the emotion being expressed. So I wanted to go back very quickly to that quote about fear. So indeed, that pattern elicited fear. We found out not just in one person, but in a few. And the pattern was very simple. In that glove you saw, uh, we just quickly vibrated the fingertips. And what that did was, Participants described it as a, a, a tingling sensation and it actually made them fearful. And so we did a study where we took a large design space of vibrotactile patterns. We actually started with over 150 patterns. And these were the full spectrum, um, all spatio-temporal patterns. Uh, and uh, we even had uh, quite a few uh, saltation patterns in there, but it was a wide spectrum. Uh, pilot through pilot testing, we narrowed that down quite a few, and then ultimately ended up uh, conducting a study to look at um, sort of what patterns elicited which emotion most commonly. Um, and here I have a few examples. This pattern we call the snake pattern. Um, simply, you feel uh, it goes from left to right. And so you can imagine this pattern kind of snaking down your back. And we didn't bias participants. I didn't say, hey, this should make you afraid. Actually, that was my intention with this pattern. I thought for sure people would be fearful because, hey, this is like a snake slithering down your back. But it was the exact opposite. Uh, majority of people said they, it made them happy because it reminded them of their childhood where as siblings they would draw letters on each other's backs with their fingers and ha you ha you'd have to guess the letter or the shape. Um, and then this spiral pattern I thought would make people happy but it was actually it just made people you know it, it was it was kind of the neutral pattern and I like to think of it as almost like a loading symbol, right? Something that's just circling and there's just nothing happening there. And then this last pattern was more annoying than anything, a six motor burst, just kind of a jarring burst and it made people angry. Um, and uh, we had a whole bunch of patterns, uh, you know, didn't have room on the slide, but we have another pattern that feels like uh, someone tapping on your shoulder. And uh, that made people fearful because uh, they thought someone was behind them. We actually had you know, a few people look over their shoulder when that was displayed. Uh, so it was interesting to see how these patterns could elicit emotions. And um, you know, the first question may be, well, why would someone want to use a device that made them angry or fearful? Um, it does at first, but then you acclimate, right? You know it's a stimulus pattern that's trying to communicate information. But I think what is achieved here is that 
um, you can, it's intuitive, you quickly know what's trying to be expressed. Um, so this was just an interesting kind of side experiment we did to see how these stimulus patterns can be used to um, evoke emotions uh, in people. Uh, basis for design, honestly, there wasn't a whole lot to go off of. Uh, we looked at literature um, that had, uh, you know, used very simple patterns. A lot of it was, you know, on the right there for uh, sort of military commands, in fact. Um, so we started there, but then expanded it to the 150 possible patterns and then narrowed that down through pilot testing. All right, so now to uh, tactile facial action units. Uh, I was interested in that middle ground. I didn't want the computer to completely solve the problem. I'm a big believer in human in the loop. So I asked the question, well, what's the middle ground? And the middle ground, ultimately, I decided spatial action units. Uh, these uh, were invented by Paul Ekman, and it's a way that we can describe um, an emotion. So for example, take, a, uh, take an emotion like angry. In terms of facial movements, that can be expressed in many different ways. Same with surprise, same with happy, so on and so forth. Facial action units are the building blocks that allow us to describe the facial movements that are happening in an emotion. And so my work was the first to take these facial action units and come up with a mapping to vibrotactile representations. What you see on the screen here is a six by eight uh, matrix of motors and from left to right, the pattern that's displayed. Um, so let's pick an easy one here. Uh, let's do raising the upper lip in the bottom right corner. So you can see that we are not um, dedicating portions of the display just to specific parts of the face. Uh, so for example, I'm not saying, hey, only the, the two bottom rows are for the mouth. Uh, you know, only the, the top two rows are for the eyes, so on and so forth. I wanted to leverage the whole display to make these as intuitive as possible. What that means is I cannot display multiple facial action units at the same time. They have to display, they have to be displayed sequentially. So I do sacrifice some efficiency there, um, but I'm all about uh, you know, intuitive designs where you can accurately perceive these um, uh, for communication. And that's not to say the other approach would be wrong. Um, I would be interesting to, to explore. I did do a little exploration into, um, you know, sort of dedicating spaces to these, but it didn't work out very well. Um, I found using more motors, uh, it, was, it was easier to interpret the patterns. Uh, here's a look at more. Um, so jaw drop, uh, you know, opening the mouth, parting the lips. Uh, so you can see some of these are quite, quite subtle. Um, uh, upper lid raiser or just basically, you know, opening the eyes wide. So this is the, the mapping that we went with. And then a couple more here. Lip corner puller is basically your smile and then lip corner depressor is basically your frown. Um, so that's a, a overview of the patterns we used. We did a study involving uh, 14 individuals who are blind. Nine were born blind, five became blind later in life. And uh, overall, uh, the recognition accuracies were, were pretty good. Uh, 10 of the 14 passed training. So we require that uh, to pass training and move on to testing, you had to get 80% or better. And we, we did allow people to try the training phase four times. So that means four of these individuals did struggle quite a bit. Um, for many folks using, uh, you know, a sensory substitution device like this is brand new. So they're not, they're not used to it. And sometimes it does take more training. Everyone's different. 
the nature of our training phase uh, was very short, fast paced, because I want, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in technologies that can be fast and easy to learn versus something where you have to spend weeks um, training on it. Uh, so it was a pretty uh, fast and furious training phase, but for those 10, uh, in terms of recognition accuracies, um, you can see that there is some struggle with some of the action units. So five, six, and seven, nine, and 10, one. I'll talk about what those are in the next slide. We also varied the duration to, of, the, uh, of the pulses. That didn't matter much, so you can go with shorter pulse durations. In terms of subjective feedback, it actually aligned pretty well with the recognition accuracies. So you can see here that um, there is some struggle with those action units I mentioned. Um, I think I have on the next slide a little, yeah, I have a little information about what happened. Um, so majority of participants did pass training and they did with approximately two training trials on average. Um, we did find a significant difference between recognition accuracies for pattern type, indicating that some patterns were more difficult to recognize than others. And for here, we did see that uh, these uh, action units I mentioned did have lower mean accuracy, 70% or less. Um, so I think overall with these is, you know, if you look at some of these, so AU, let's look at AU5, six and seven and nine. Let's go back here. Um, let's see, six. I don't think I put them all on here. So it's not, not everyone's on here. I think I left those out, but that's okay. Um, with these, a lot of the movement was happening in the uh, center of the face. So you had subtle mouth movements and, uh, and you also had some patterns where a lot of the movement was happening with the eyebrows and they were subtle movements. And so what we tried to do, we did redesign these. And what we tried to do was, uh, for lack of a better word, exaggerate the differences so that they could be a little bit more distinct. So I'll talk about that next. But overall, we did receive very positive feedback from participants, um, which told us, hey, we might be on the right track with this. Uh, so I know this is probably a little difficult to see, um, but this is the redesign. Uh, so for example, um, AU9, which is uh, just wrinkling up your nose, we made those movements a little bit more subtle and kind of centered on the display versus before there was a lot more vertical movement and so then it would overlap with like you know the eyebrow movement for example so we made adjustments in that way um, to further make these distinct um, opening uh, uh, the upper lid razor on the bottom right there basically opening up your your eyes um, we uh, made that movement greater because it was a little too subtle before. Um, so we made different changes such as these uh, and the results um, uh, were, were much better, which I'll talk about in just a moment. The next study we wanted to look at, we asked the question, so, so from that first, previous study, people could recognize these action units, but then we ask the question, can you not only recognize the action units, but associate emotions to them? So we did a study to investigate this. So this is the, the GUI that we used, just a simple, simple GUI. The, the participants did not see this, um, where we could send individual action units, or we could send an emotion. So for example, 
um, if we pick out, you know, we could pick out a simple one here. Um, let's do surprise and let's look at uh, AU5 and AU26 representing surprise. So AU5 is opening your eyes and then AU26 is dropping your jaw, right? So your eyes are open, jaws drop, surprise. Um, we click that and send those action units. And not only did someone need to recognize those action units, but also recognize that together, that means surprise. So overall, just on action units alone and action unit combinations with the redesign, um, performance was uh, much better. AU1 was still a bit of a struggle uh, for, for some people. And if we go back to the previous slide, uh, AU1 is the uh, second pattern top row. Inner brow razor, kind of it's kind of scrunching up uh, your forehead um, and your eyebrows kind of go, go inward. Um, it's something we commonly do, but uh, if you kind of isolate that and say, you know, here's a, this is a, an action unit that you're going to learn. It's a little bit, you know, uh, not as intuitive, I think people found. Um, so that could probably be redesigned a bit better, but still, um, we were happy with those results. In terms of associating these with emotions, people did pretty well. Um, now, I want to point out that this is about learning the mappings and recognizing them. We're not asking people to make these associations on their own. In other words, I don't present someone with AU5 and AU20 and ask them what emotion comes to mind. Instead, they learn that mapping in advance. So a disclaimer is, are people actually understanding the emotions or are they simply recognizing it, you know, doing pattern recognition? Um, I think it's a mix of both. I think for some people um, who are born blind, who may, ha you know, have never seen these expressions, uh, this is very novel. Uh, but for those who uh, became blind later in life, they're very familiar with these. Having said that, though, uh, performance across the board was pretty consistent. Uh, people who are born blind did just as well as people who became blind later in life who just who did just as well as those who are sighted. Um, so definitely this work warrants further investigation in terms of how people are understanding and visualizing these. A little bit of the breakdown. We did have a much smaller number of participants. We only had eight for this study. Um, six past training. Five identified as blind and one visually impaired. Uh, so we definitely had a, a smaller group. And so, you know, something in the future, we do want to have, you know, a larger, larger group of participants for this. No significant differences were found in any of the analyses we did. Clearly, they, there was some struggle with AU1, which associated with sad, uh, sadness. Um, but otherwise, um, uh, I should also mention that many participants did not have difficulty. So that created some large variability in terms of recognizing that particular pattern. Um, most of the confusion occurred between fear, anger, and surprise, given that there's still, you know, of course, a lot of overlap with these patterns. Um, and the expression can often be subtle. Uh, we repeated the experiment with people who are sighted. And uh, similar performance was found. In fact, no significant differences were found. And so that uh, told us that uh, you know, the results are quite promising uh, because regardless of visual experience, these patterns can be learned and recognized. Uh, but can they be understood in terms of what is actually happening there? That's an area that needs further investigation. Also, I want to point out that the training phases were very short in duration. So that was another positive outcome. You know, typically we're talking about 
you know, very short, you know, five to uh, five to ten minutes of training to be able to use this system. Um, we also um, did a uh, just a pilot test for someone who's never used the system, came in, sat down, and did a quick three minute test run, and then um, you know more of a familiarization phase than training, and he was able to use the system um, uh, in real time interacting with someone. And so I think there's a lot of potential here in these types of technologies. If the design is, is good, then training can be minimized. Limitations are that we do have a, you know, we did have small sample sizes. There were age differences between sighted and blind in VI groups. And then also small sample sizes per subgroups within the blind VI group. Um, and so that's difficult to kind of, you know, tease out the differences between those subgroups. Um, so to do, you know, some deeper exploration, we would need uh, to recruit, uh, recruit more people. In terms of future work, uh, we, uh, uh, we actually completed the first step uh, we wanted to build a national database of blind and, and, and VI, and that's something we did. Uh, we have, I think the number's at 400 right now of people who are willing to participate in studies. Uh, part of the challenge with haptics is that it involves a physical prototype usually. So how do you do a remote study? Um, that's something that we are also addressing in terms of future work. And we've actually built a low-cost version of the VibroTactile display. And it's also um, uh, the, the um, dimensionality is lower. So instead of a six by eight, it's actually a four by four. Um, and so it's kind of, uh, it's not intuitive, right? You'd think, let's go higher res. Um, I was interested in the opposite of that. What if we go lower res? And what if we build something that's, you know, a you know, a few bucks to build and something that you could just slap on the back of a chair or embed in a shirt. Um, and then now you have a new haptic display that you could use in daily life. Um, and I actually redesigned the patterns. Uh, they're not published yet. Um, and I've only done a pilot test, but the recognition accuracy is very high on these low dimensional patterns. Uh, and that leads to that second bullet point. I'm very interested in not just um, uh, touch, but also voice. So social interaction is not just, um, you know, haptics, there's a voice component. So the study I'm conducting right now looks at how well we can recognize just from audio an emotion being expressed versus if we had audio and, um, and these vibrotactile facial action units. That actually leads to one of the questions posted on Murrow, is this applicable to cite it? So I'd like to save that for when we get to that question. I'll come back to this. And then of course, longitudinal studies. We would like to deploy this and have people using it in the rural world. Um, so very quickly, because I know, I think we have like uh, one or two minutes left in the talk. Um, I wanna make sure we have time for the Q&A. So I'm going to give a, just a very quick tour of some of my other projects. I'm very awesome. Uh, I'm very interested also in um, supporting non-visual travel for individuals who are blind, but I'm not a believer in the, um, the approach of let's help someone get from A to B, you know, five steps forward, left, uh, 10 steps to the left, turn right. Uh, my conversations with individuals who are blind have revealed that majority may may prefer other means. Um, and so a lot of people I talk to, they want to know about obstacles around them. And so this project, we're working on uh, assistive technologies to enhance situational awareness. Uh, and uh, we've published a couple papers so far. And the idea is we can design spatiotemporal patterns that you can fill around your waist. It's 360 degrees and it communicates information about how far the object is away, its direction, and also its elevation. So if it's like head height, maybe it's another person. If it's lower to the ground, something else. Again, I don't wanna solve the problem. I wanna have a human in the loop solution. 
And the results have just been incredible so far. We, we had, uh, uh, you know, the pattern I have here is person approaches from behind you, um, goes around you and then moves forward. And people who are blind have tried this and with uh, no training on the more uh, complex spatio-temporal patterns, these scenarios that I have here on this slide, um, these brand new situations that they've never encountered, these new patterns, they can recognize on the first try and understand them. We had an example where uh, a car was, uh, or something at a car height, was coming from their right side, stopped in front of them and went on to their left. And we had a user say, hey, that was, that was my Uber ride. Uh, and so people are not only able to recognize, but understand at a deep level of what these patterns possibly could mean. Um, some of my early work uh, in Viber Tactile Motor Instructions and Feedback, um, shown on this slide, I was very interested in um, how we can use vibrations to communicate information about the fundamental movements of the human body and provide feedback. And that involved to rehab where we um, built serious games and different haptic controllers uh, to help um, in, in rehabilitation. We worked with stroke survivors. We worked with individuals with cerebral palsy. Um, and nowadays I'm working a lot on wearable technologies and trying to apply these to, to rehab. And a lot of this work evolved into um, a project I did uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, you know, Arizona State University. We have our Sun Devil Stadium. We turned it into a, a smart stadium working with Intel, deploying different sensors and technologies. And so we did everything from serious games for fans that they could play uh, to, you know, if I could access how long is the concession line on my phone so I don't miss the game to understanding crowd behavior to promote uh, safety and awareness. And that evolved into this um, uh, NSF sponsored uh, project of mine. So uh, we were awarded an NRT grant from National Science Foundation. This is a $3 million grant. And I built a training program at Arizona State University on the topic of uh, citizen-centered smart cities and smart living. Um, and it's, it's a great program. Um, a couple of the students in the program are, are attending today's talk and um, I have uh, fellowships available. So if you're uh, thinking of doing a master's, thinking of doing a, a PhD, uh, we have fellowships available to support your programs. And you could um, pursue that in any topic related to smart cities or smart living, which also includes assistive technologies. And then uh, just a, sh a shameless plug, uh, I have a book out. It's an edited book on haptic interfaces for accessibility, health, and enhanced quality of life. And uh, the book uh, 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 includes uh, just fa uh, you know fantastic array of researchers around the world who work in haptics. And my goal of this book was to bring attention to uh, the need for more innovation related to uh, uh, assistive technologies and, and health and wellness. And this is out through Springer. And then just acknowledging my funding support, uh, especially through the National Science Foundation and the Zimmon Institute. And then finally, thank you. Uh, I appreciate your time and I look forward uh, to uh, uh, some questions. Great, thank you very much, that was wonderful. Um, before we go to the questions, I'm just gonna launch a really quick poll and uh, then that will give you time, Troy, to look over anything that's been posted and for people to post some more. Uh, this will just take a few minutes, so we'd really appreciate um, your participation. You should be seeing it on your screens. Are people seeing it? I can see yep. it, but I don't have any buttons to click on. Yeah, yeah you're a co-host. So. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm getting responses now, so great. All right. 
Okay, it's looking like everyone is about done. Is that true? Anyone need more time? You can raise your hands. <laughs> okay, I think I'll um, I'll just leave it running. Um, there's, it's not going to hurt anything. You can move it to the side. I'll stop it in a minute, but we can go ahead with the questions. I think people have probably read this. Um, so, Troy, did you want to start with the ones posted to Mero or the ones that have been sent to me? And I don't know if any were sent to you as well. Sure, we could start with, um, how about Mero board? I did uh, write down, we had four on there that I wrote down. Okay. Uh, so the first is, is this applicable to the side? So um, the interesting thing with assistive technology is, uh, it's, it's wild to believe, but most assistive technologies, I think, find applications to the general population. I mentioned some of those quotes at the start. And uh, for example, uh, someone had said, uh, I, wanna, I wanna be able to take notes in the classroom just like my peers. And this was actually someone who is low vision, so he's legally blind, but he had a little bit of sight uh, so even with corrected vision, to be able to read something, it had to be right up to his face. And so he was using a monocular in the classroom, sort of like a mini telescope to take notes. And so what we did was we built this note taker device. It was a camera on top of a pan tilt zoom mechanism that connected to his laptop, not a laptop, but a tablet. And on that tablet, we created custom software where on half of the screen, he could see what the camera was capturing. And then on the other half, he could take notes. Um, the reason we just didn't, uh, he could record as well, but we wanted the note taking feature because uh, it improves retention when you take notes in the classroom. And so we built a prototype and it was pretty amazing because he actually had to, uh, he actually came to us out of desperation because he was a junior in computer science. He had to drop all his classes, because especially the math classes, they were becoming too fast paced for him. So he couldn't keep up. Uh, we gave him this prototype. He retook those classes, got straight A's. And so we applied for a grant from the National Science Foundation. And we got uh, for that project half a million to uh, basically improve the design. And we built a suite of these devices and deployed them to students at Arizona State University, University of Arizona, and Northern Arizona University, where we had a whole bunch of people who were of blind and low vision. Uh, it was you know, mostly geared toward those who are low vision using the technology. And then all of a sudden, we had all these emails coming in from sighted students saying they wanted one because they would see the student in the classroom using it. And they're like, hey, I want one. I want to be able to record the notes and, and take notes using this device. And with this, uh, so that, that's a common trend I see. And even with this technology, I think we all have moments where we're like, oh, I, I really wish I could see that person and get a sense of their expressions. And that often happens uh, with remote communication, especially over the phone. Um, I think sometimes it's really difficult to, you know, if you don't have access to someone's facial expressions, then it's, it can be difficult to gauge their uh, emotional responses in particular. So absolutely, this is applicable to, to cite it. Uh, the next question is, how to increase capacity to participate for individuals who are blind? So, um, uh, so with related to um, social interactions, uh, I gave some, um, you know, some, some anecdotes about that and some different stories. And I think such a technology would enhance participation. But having said that, I think in general, I, I see, I don't think individuals who are blind, I, they're, they're actively engaged in social, social interactions. I think this technology would just, um, more than anything, enhance performance at work. At least that's you know, where, where, where social interactions are critical. That's where I think I see the, the biggest use of this. Uh, but one area that I'd like to mention that needs a lot of attention, and that's sports and exercise. Uh, individuals who are blind um, really struggle with being as active as their sighted peers. 
Um, imagine going to the, your local gym and not being able to see. Um, I mean, it's a nightmare. There, there's so much equipment, so many things you could bump into and get hurt on. Um, it's, it's a dangerous, intimidating environment for people who are blind. And then think of sports, you know, we take it for granted, you know, hey, we want to, you know, put together a game of, of basketball or, or get together, play some table tennis. But for someone who is blind, uh, that's, it's, it's still largely inaccessible. They're, they're left out of these opportunities. I've held uh, two focus groups so far on how, on this problem area. And I have been brainstorming the last three, four years on this problem, and I have not come up with a solution. So if you think of something, I mean, this could be a fantastic area to innovate in. Um, there are specific support, uh, sports that have been created uh, and played by people who are blind. Um, and, but, you know, I'm talking more generally, like sports and exercise in general. Uh, the next question, benefits of vibrotactile motion communication over speech. Uh, so that goes back to the work I'm doing now related to voice, combining voice with these tactile facial action units. Um, and I don't really see um, vibrotactile motion communication as, I, I don't intend to, to replace voice. Um, I see it more as augmenting or maybe providing some additional information when you don't have access uh, to, um, to the visual element and you can't see the emotions, but I, I don't intend to replace, but I mean, you could see this as sort of a standalone thing. I know there's a lot of researchers that have looked at, you know, vibrotactile emoticons. Um, and there's some work in that space, especially in uh, haptic interpersonal communication. Uh, but uh, I, I see them as complementing each other, and that's that's the next study I'm working on. And unfortunately, uh, my study was ready to go uh, in uh, in, in uh, early March. I think we recruited uh, one or two people before you know COVID came about, and so I had to pause it, and still haven't been able to get that up and running yet. Um, the other question is related, or I think it was more of a comment related to smart clothing. I mean, absolutely. Um, like right now, my displays have largely worked with the waist, you know, using belts with the back. And I've also done a lot of work with sleeves. But I mean, you could imagine as actually, you know, actuators being embedded into clothing and we just, you know, slip on a shirt or, you know, whatnot. Um, I think the problem with uh, a lot, you know, these vibrotactile actuators, um, there's a size limitation, right? With ERMs or LRAs, um, they do have to be a certain size. So we can't just keep miniaturizing these uh, because there is a physical element. Um, so can we come up with alternative actuator designs where you could, you know, innovate, um, uh, the design of these and miniaturize them and get these ultra high resolution haptic displays. Um, there's a lot of people working on that and I think it's an exciting area of research. Um, the, the only work I've done in that space has been on um, resonant based um, uh, vibrotactile displays where there's, there's no motor, none of that. It's a 3D printed structure and we use uh, the fundamental frequencies in, in audio to uh, you know, think of a, a, turn, uh, a tuning fork um, to vibrate the, the individual elements. Um, those we were able to get really high resolution, but the problem is um, um, there was a, we ran into a lot of issues related more on the material side of things. Um, so, but I, I, I know that's an active area of research as well. Um, so those were the questions I had on Murrow. Uh, Wendy, did, did any questions come in through the chat? Yes, there are some. So the first ones were from Munia Ziat. Sorry for mispronouncing your name, but if you want to ask your questions yourself, Munia, would that be? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, 
Hi, Troy. Uh, I think we miss each other at World Haptics. We were doing the same workshop. I was in the Affective Haptics. Oh, yes. With the, the other workshop. So uh, my, I, I did my PhD on sensory substitution. So I, I, I met Paul Magirita, who was working on the TVSS. And you mentioned sensory substitution. Uh, one of the issue or one of the uh, of these technologies uh, is the lack of qualia or what we know as uh, emotional quality of object. We know that there is a high uh, rate of recognition in terms of identifying an object and especially your work in what facial expression, but there is also a lack of emotion within the user. So do you have any solution or idea on how to improve this aspect? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, uh, Paul Baki Rita's work, in fact, is, uh, you know, something that uh, really inspired me early on. And in fact, you know, I told the story how I started in surgical simulators. And when I first got into haptics, uh, uh, Baki Rita's work was the, the first work I, I encountered. And it was just, it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, uh, the, you know, his work on the TVSS system, and now you know, all the work going on with the brain port device. Um, so I'm, so yeah, you, you, it's a, it's a great question. And um, it, it's a, it's a challenging question. And I think for me, one thing I'm interested in is, um, you know, how, how can we get at the full range of emotion? Um, so I'll give you an example. Right now, um, uh, I'm, uh, you know, we actually, we finished um, uh, collecting the data right before COVID for this study I'm going to mention. Um, and uh, we're in the process of analyzing the data. So I, I don't have any results yet, but the study looks at a, a thermo vibro tactile pattern. So we basically, took spatiotemporal fibrotactile patterns, um, ones that we found could, uh, you know, elicit a variety of emotions. Uh, and we combined those with temperature, you know, with thermal simulation. And so, for example, you may feel a pattern and also a cooling sensation, or you may feel a pattern in a, in a, uh, a warm sensation. And the literature um, usually collects ratings in terms of balance and arousal. And uh, one uh, claim in the literature or some ideas in the literature are that, uh, you know, when you do that, you can't get at um, the full range of, of the dimensions given the limitations of the stimuli. Um, and so are there different methods to, to exploring this? And so th that's something that intrigues me quite a bit because ultimately, yeah, if we want to create um, not, you know, novel devices and, and, and facilitate different interactions, we do want access to that you know, high emo emotional quality. And so with this study, we were looking at, well, if we have thermal stimulation and in more complex spatiotemporal patterns, will that get us at a larger range of emotions? And that's something that hasn't been investigated yet. If you look at the vibrotactile stimulation, it's usually quite simple. And people are looking at you know, a variety of other dimensions as well. Um, uh, Stephen Brewster is doing a lot of uh, you know, work in this space right now. Um, and uh, so that, that's something I'm very interested in and uh, it's still a very active area, uh, but I think a very important area that, you know, a lot of folks in haptics needs, to, you know, need to work on because we do have to get a higher, you know, break into that higher range of emotions and achieve that higher emotional quality. So still an active area and uh, we, we collected the data for this study. I'm hoping to see a larger range of emotions and then what has been done specifically for thermo vibro tactile uh, stimulation but um, we haven't uh, we haven't yet finished the data analysis so 
we actually have plans to wrap that up soon and publish a paper by the end of the year. So hopefully, fingers crossed, some interesting findings there, but, but we'll see. But yeah, great, great question. Uh, and that was also, I, uh, you kind of all, uh, answered my second question. I was going to ask you if you have to find different types of technologies, such as temperature. Uh, and we know vibration, uh, it's, uh, it's always like about changing frequency, uh, timing. But have you tried like pressures, piece uh, uh, stretch, and the other type of haptic technology rather than vibration? You mm -hmm. mentioned temperature, but uh, um, because uh, you know, touch is not just about vibration, but uh, about multiple type of sensation that we can um, stimulate the body with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, I have so uh, when I first started, I was mostly interested in force feedback and um, and so one project I did early on, kind of in the realm of sensory substitution, was looking at how color could be represented um, through, uh, through force feedback. And it's kind of a, uh, at the time it was like a, a, kind of an interesting idea. Well, okay, why would you represent color through, through force feedback? But what we had in mind was if you could use a device on your computer um, and if you're surfing the web and you want to know, okay, what's the color of this or, you know, what's, what's the blending of this color. So we used a force feedback device to communicate RGB um, and also beyond RGB. Um, uh, uh, we were looking at other dimensions as well. And that project actually had, it, it was quite successful. Uh, we later went on to create um, a vibro tactile version of that. Um, so I have done some work on the force feedback side, but ultimately my interests shifted to vibrotactile because I'm very much interested in wearables. Um, and so I've been, you know, been looking at vibrotactile for years and uh, thermals of interest as well. Uh, but more recently, I am getting back into force feedback. Um, there's a lot of interest nowadays in soft muscles, you know, these, these pneumatic actuators. And so I have a collaborative uh, project with uh, some colleagues in Japan where we're um, looking at, um, you know, building these uh, soft muscles. Uh, you know, in Japan, a uh, uh, big portion of the, the population is, um, you know, 65 plus. And a lot of these people, they, wait, they want to age in place and they, wait, they want to maintain an independent lifestyle. And a lot of these people are farmers, you know, they're in rural areas. And so can you build wearable technologies that um, allow them to age in place as long as possible? And so we're doing a lot of work right now on these soft muscle suits um, that use force feedback. Um, that's less on the perceptual side, more on just you know, the physical, uh, physical aspects. Thank you so much. That's yeah, absolutely. Sense. We have two more people with questions. I think that's all we'll have time for. So uh, Vishnu first, he's been waiting a while. <laughs> that's fine. He kind of answered the question that I was asking too anyway. Uh, yeah, like you were talking about the learning curve being very short in the experiments that you have done. Uh, what would the average uh, learning curve be for just learning those AU1, AU2 things or even the emotion by itself? And would you think when the range of identifications like probably from 15 emotions to 20, 200 other things would that contrast obviously would contrast learning curve are there any like should there be any set of guidelines or like a limit of like okay we can only do 200 interactions or 200 object identifications kind of a thing mm -hmm. yeah great questions limitations i would say yeah yeah thanks vishnu great questions so, um, you know, when you were talking about the learning curve, it made me think of, uh, so in human factors, we have something called Baker's basic um, uh, ergonomic equation and, and, uh, and it, it's pretty simple. The greater the learning curve, if someone's going to, um, you know, and the more factors that come into play with, with having to use your technology, then uh, the, the benefit of using it has to be there, right? And so it's a bit of a balancing act. 
And so I think that if you were to, um, obviously adding more action units, yes, that will take more time to learn the system. But I think if people see the benefit and can benefit from using it and want to spend the time, they'll do it. In terms of the learning curve, uh, for the action units we had in either study, the, the training times were well below um, 30 minutes. I mean, for most, I think it was like pretty short, like 15 minutes. We had a few outliers who I think needed more time, like 30 minutes, but overall very short training times. And for me, um, like I said, I'm, I'm all about intuitive, you know, intuitive designs. Um, I think whenever um, you know, if we look at, uh, if I may call them haptic languages. So if you want to design something uh, to commun for communication, be it uh, Braille or, uh, you know, Morse code uh, or some of the lesser known languages like Vibrates, um, we have to look at the design and you'll see that if it's, if there's logic behind the design, it's going to be easier to pick up than if it's completely abstract. Um, so for example, Braille, Braille may seem totally abstract, but it's not, there's some logic there. So it was easier to learn than say, its predecessor, night writing. Night writing failed quite a bit because there's no logic and, um, you know, and, and for many other reasons, um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm about, you know, instilling logic in the design so that it's intuitive, so that we can minimize the, the training, minimize that learning curve, and increase the chance of someone actually adopting and using the technology. Great. Did, did that answer your questions? Uh, sure. Yeah, kind of. Uh, did you see the technology that Apple patented? I don't know if they have the product. They do have a uh, a wearable device very similar to a jacket or a coat and they have a camera embedded right in front of the jacket uh, it was targeted over blind people and uh, it was more about the directions to replace the dog and kin uh, aspect of it mm. i haven't seen that one um, uh, i'll look for one and i'll send the patent over yeah, send that to me. I'd love to love to see it. Yeah, so it's time. been a while since I've seen that too. Yeah. Okay, I didn't mean to cut you off, Vishnu. If you could send that to everyone, that would be great. Sure. Um, and the last question is from Elizabeth, and then it will be time to go. So actually, am I on? You are. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, seems like the uh, vibro tactical interfaces work really well for information that's basically spatial. The distances and the orientations and then sort of facial layout although with facial layout you're starting to get into a little bit more of a I don't know a, it's not quite a symbolic space it's more of a like a sensory decoding kind of thing where you're amplifying some parts of the face and toning down other parts of the facial gestures um, do you have a sense that um, vibro tactical interfaces can transfer to some much more um, complex or symbolic kind of domains rather than ones where there's just a strong spatial analogy? Yeah, great question. Definitely. Um, so I know that uh, I mentioned Stephen Brewster's work earlier. So yeah, he's, he's also done a lot of work in this space where uh, one study comes to mind where uh, he was um, basically created uh, vibro tactile patterns to communicate something as simple as uh, uh, just like uh, sort of calendar information. Okay, you got a meeting and it's at this time and this is the importance of it. And so people, um, yeah, people can, uh, can pick these up pretty well. Now in that ex specific example I gave, um, his, uh, his work is in the realm of, of uh, tactons and, and these largely, uh, the, the mapping doesn't have uh, 
you know, uh, any logic. Uh, so here's uh, some vibrotactile patterns and we're going to associate these meanings to them, but people can learn them uh, uh, pretty quickly and, and understand them, them just fine. So I do think there's a lot of opportunity here for moving beyond spatial information. Um, and it could be more symbolic information. It could be, um, uh, you know, it could be spatial, temporal, both, or symbolic as well. I think there's a lot of potential uh, uh, for vibrotactile in that space. Um, and I think it deserves more attention as well. I think a lot of the work that I've seen is, is on the spatial side. Um, but I have seen some fantastic studies where uh, symbolic information can be uh, uh, communicated as well. And there's also a lot of interest right now on, uh, on language. So can we, uh, so in speech, uh, you know, we have phonemes and we use phonemes to build words and communicate. Um, can we have something similar in haptics where we are basically creating you know, speech and, and haptics. And um, I mean, uh, uh, Hong Tan has just had some amazing work come out recently uh, in, in that space. Um, so I think there's tremendous potential. Okay, if I can, maybe I can follow up. I don't know if there's still time. Um, because the other thing I would say is to take it to an extreme and stand it on its head. It's what would be the benefit for um, people experiencing hearing loss or hearing problems where what they're losing is spoken language and elements of their physical environment. Um, and so then you're trying to replace the very rich human language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Uh, tremendous potential and um, that area has been pretty active. Um, so the tactate devices come to mind. Um, uh, there's that, there's and some there's some earlier uh, prototypes as well, um, but the tactate device was probably the most um, uh, uh, successful, and that was commercially available for for a while. It no longer is, but that allowed people uh, with hearing impairments to be able to uh, better perceive speech, to do lip reading, and things of that nature. And then over time, they approved, you know, improved the device and added more channels. I think when it first started out, you know, it was like two channels, speech and non-speech. And then they added, I think it was, um, you know, seven, seven plus channels and so on. So it was a, pr a pretty rich information source for those with hearing impairments. But yeah, the tactate device comes, comes to mind there. But yeah, tremendous potential. Well, that was great. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Elizabeth, but I, I wanted to let people who have other obligations uh, um, go and hopefully you guys can continue this conversation offline from, from everyone. But thank you so much, Troy. It was wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. It was an honor. I enjoyed the talk and especially all the questions. Uh, thank you all so much. Well, thank you.